Greetings. My name is Dave Yeski, and I want to thank you for joining me for a brief review of the performance of the premiums, which I promise will include a discussion of what a premium is, if you don't already know. So we're going to start with just that. We're going to start with a definition of what I mean by premiums. Um, and once we get that out of the way, it's really going to take the form of a tour. Uh, it's going to be a, an historical tour of the, how the premiums are performed uh, over various time periods, both in the U.S. and outside the U.S., and, uh, and a look at the more recent history and what that might be telling us about what's to come. So to begin with, market prices can tell us a lot about what we can expect from, a, from any given stock. Market prices contain a lot of information, and, and they become information dense through trading. You know, investors all show up in the market with their non-overlapping bits of information, and through their buying and selling, that information becomes embedded in the price. And so prices become information dense. And if we know how to look and we know what to look for, we can use price information in order to think about how to build a portfolio that can have the returns we need in a diversified way. So here are the three primary premiums I want to talk about. The first one is the market premium. And this is just the additional return you earn by being in stocks rather than in bonds. Or for most of this presentation, when we say bonds, we're going to be talking about the 30-year Treasury bill, which is about as safe as you can possibly get. The 30-year Treasury bill is the equivalent of uh, money market funds and other really stable investments. So this first premium is the difference between, is the difference you expect to earn by being in stocks rather than in bonds or, or short-term T-bills. The next one is the premium you earn when you choose to invest in small companies versus large companies. The third and final one is, we're calling it relative price. More frequently, we refer to it as a value premium. Uh, and relative price refers to stocks that are trading at a low price relative to their earnings or their assets. Now, when we look at the evidence for these premiums uh, and, and, and the story they have to tell us as investors, we're, we're only looking for premiums that are, that are sensible, persistent, pervasive, robust, and cost-effective. Now, what, what we mean by this is that there is a sensible economic story here. You know, we're not believers in, in atheoretical models. We're not believers in data mining and just saying, well, we think something is true because it's been true. There has to be, a, there has to be an underlying economic explanation that we can rely on. And it has to be an economic explanation that will allow us to, to make assumptions about whether or not this is going to be a persistent phenomenon. Again, it's not enough to say that because something has happened in the past, it will persist in the future, unless we have some underlying explanation for why that should be the case. It must be robust across different kinds of markets, uh, both in the U.S. and outside the U.S. And finally, it has to be cost effective. If we identify a, a you know, if we identify a factor or a or a premium uh, that looks attractive but is expensive to harness. Then that may not be that may not be effective uh, an effective way to build a portfolio. Now these are also referred to sometimes as risk factors or priced risk factors, and I mention this because you'll sometimes you'll sometimes hear this approach referred to as factor investing, where investors attempt to identify those distinct persistent factors in the market that seem to have unique returns associated with them, and then assemble portfolios based on those factors. So let's take it as an example of how price can give us a lot of information about a stock or a group of stocks or a whole segment of stocks by starting with the, the so-called relative price or value factor. I'm going to start by talking about a thing called book value. Now, book value is just a measure of the, of the value of all of a company's stuff. So all of the office buildings or factories that a company owns, its inventory, its retained earnings, um, all of those things added up become its book value. So it's the tangible value of everything a company owns minus depreciation. So you can measure companies this way. And in fact, you could take companies and divide, take their total book value, total value of 
everything they own, the buildings and factories and inventory and cash and all the rest, take the value of all of that and divide through by the number of shares outstanding on the market, and you come up with a measure called book value per share. Well, you can have two companies that have the same book value per share. So in terms of book value, you'd say, well, these companies are the same or they're the same size. But one of them could be trading at $6 a share versus a $3 book value. That would mean it's trading at two times book value, while another company with exactly the same book value per share is trading at $15 or five times that much. We would call that first company, in this case, ABC Inc., a value company because it's trading at a low multiple. It's trading at a low price relative to its assets. Whereas XYZ Inc., we would call a growth company because it's trading at a high multiple. It's trading, trading at a high price relative to its assets. So we can identify these premiums by essentially a, some very simple, um, very simple math. We're just subtracting one number from another. So in this first instance, when we're talking about large companies versus small, this, this is the average over the last 90 years. In this first instance in the U.S., you can see that the average return to small company stocks has been almost 12%, while the average return to large company stocks has been close to 10%. And so if you subtract the return of large company stocks from the return to small company stocks, the difference this little more than 2% is the premium you earn by investing in small company stocks rather than large. And you can, do, you can use exactly the same approach when you're looking at relative price, which is to say looking at value stocks. In that case, you simply subtract the, the, uh, the returns to growth stocks, those, price, those are trading, that are trading at a high multiple, uh, from value stocks, those are trading at a low multiple. And in this case, you can see that, you know, over the last 90 years, that difference has averaged 3.3%, the annual average difference. So on average, value stocks provided a 3.3% higher return. And we'll say more about in a minute about where what that pattern of returns looks like. One thing I'll note, I've been talking about the U.S., um, size premium and value premium in terms of what we've seen over the last 90 years. When we look at stocks outside the U.S., the period is shorter. We're using data from 1970 instead of data from 1928, and that's because the that's simply when the data became available. And for emerging markets, we're using data from 1989 because, again, uh, reliable data on emerging markets didn't really become available before that date. So we're always using the largest, well, not always, in this instance, we're using the largest possible data set available to us. Now, here's what it looks like graphically for the U.S. markets. And this, again, these are annual premiums from 1928 through 1918, so that 90-year period. And what you'll note is that, um, you know, there were many stretches where, in this first instance, where the market return, which is to say, or the market premium, which is to say the the higher return you, you earned by buying stocks rather than T-bills, uh, there are long stretches where, where that was positive. But there were also stretches where it was negative. And this is the thing that's important to remember is these are risk premiums. To the degree you earn an extra increment of return, to the degree you earn a premium, it's because you're taking a risk. Now, if these earned a positive premium every year, if stocks always beat bonds, well, then they wouldn't be risky. The only reason they're considered risky is because they mostly beat bonds, but they don't always beat bonds. We have these periods where they do much worse. And so this is one of the things that we're looking at. Now, the other thing to notice with all three of these charts, the top one is showing which, you know, the, the, additional, the additional premium you earn by buying stocks rather than bonds or T-bills. The middle one shows the additional premium you earn by buying small company stocks versus large. And the bottom one shows the additional premium you earn by buying value stocks, low price stocks versus growth stocks or high price stocks. Now, the thing to notice here is that in general, these premiums occur, there's a, there's, the premiums appear more often than they don't. There are periods when they're not present, but they're present more often than not. The other thing to notice is that when they are present, they tend to be bigger than when they're absent. So this is, 
This is what causes them to pro pro produce an attractive return or an attractive premium over the long run. And again, we'll burrow into this a little more deeply momentarily. Now, this is what it looks like outside the U.S. Again, the top one being the, the difference between stocks and bonds, the middle one being the difference between small company stocks and large, and the bottom one being the value stocks, low price stocks versus large pri uh, high price stocks. And you'll see that the same pattern persists. It's a little bit, there are fewer years here because it's a shorter time period. And finally, in emerging markets, yet again, you'll see that um, when the premiums are present, they tend to be larger and they tend to be present a little more often. Let's take a deep dive back into the U.S. So these are annual returns in the U.S. for the market premium, the difference between investing in stocks versus bonds. And what you'll see is that that average premium is a little over 8%. Now, the returns to the stock market were not 8%. That was how much more you earned by being in the stock market versus being in T-bills, 30-day T-bills. And they, over that same period of time, averaged somewhere between 2 and 3%. So the return to the stock market as a whole in the U.S. over this 90-year period was a little better than 10%. But you can see there were, there were, you know, consistently there were years showing up that in which the premium was absent, which stocks did a lot worse than T-bills. Here's again the U.S. market, and this is showing us the difference between owning small companies, the returns to small company stocks versus large company stocks. And that premium was almost 4%. So over this 90-year period, on average, you earned almost 4% a year more owning small company stocks versus large. But again, you could see that there are stretches where small company stocks lagged. And finally, value stocks. These are, again, the annual returns to value, the, the annual premiums to low price stocks versus high price stocks. And that was 4.7%, so approaching 5% over the long run. And we're going to spend some extra time talking about value stocks in just a few minutes. So now this is the five-year premium. So these are five-year rolling periods. So each one of these bars represents the return over five, the premium over five years. Now what you could, what I think you can see is that <clears throat> uh, when you expand it to five-year periods, uh, it's much more often that the premium is present. It's, it's relatively more rare that the premium is absent for a whole five years, especially when it comes to stocks versus bonds, which is the one at the top. Uh, and, and at the bottom, the value premium likewise is, is very rarely absent for five years. A little bit more present in the middle one, which is the small company premium. Small companies are subject to a thing the economists call a temporal clustering, which means that that their returns tend to can often be very concentrated. They may blow the doors off in any given five or, or seven year period or five or ten year period, but they may do it in only a couple of years out of that. And again, we'll see we'll see more examples of that in a moment. So this is the U.S. market for those three premiums or risk factors. This is the market. These are the markets outside the U.S. And again, you see that when you look at five year periods, the premiums are much more frequently present. And finally, in emerging markets, the same thing applies. The premium uh, is much is absent uh, much less frequently when you're looking at a five-year holding period. So now let's burrow again, burrow into the burrow down into the U.S. market on this five-year basis, um, and you can see that again, um, the 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 absence of the premium is is much less. The premium is much more present. You see the same thing with the small company effect. And again, you see that with value stocks as well, the value premium, I should say. And again, remember that this is the diff this is a difference. This is not giving us a return. And in fact, in these charts, we've represented it as a percentage. So you know, you interpret the bar on the top as telling you that it did 10% better or it did 20% better than uh, than growth stocks. And and when there's a bar on the bottom, it's telling you that it did 10 or 20% worse. Than growth stocks. That's what the that's what the scale on the left is telling you. So now let's look at ten-year holding periods. Uh, now again, this is the U.S. market, and just as we saw with a five-year period, you see there are there are fewer red bars still. That when you're looking at an entire ten-year period, the probability is much higher that this premium is going to manifest itself. That this premium is going to be realized. Um, certainly, when you're talking about the the top chart, which is stocks versus bonds. Uh, much fewer periods. Uh, the middle one, small company stocks, again, um, 
much more often, much more frequently do we see that small company stocks are besting large company stocks over a 10-year period, and likewise with the value premium on the bottom. Again, now we're looking at developed markets outside the U.S., and the same thing is true. And finally, emerging markets outside the U.S., and again, uh, it's a shorter it's a shorter history, um, but very much the same thing is is present over a ten year period. You're much more likely to capture the benefits of that risk premium. So now let's do the the, the burrow down on the U.S. market based on this ten year premium. So uh, if we look at some more recent years, you'll see that there were two ten year rolling periods um, that were that were not too long ago, and this was actually. The 10-year period, these two red bars represent the 10-year period ending in 2008 and the 10-year period ending in 2009. And those have been, you can see those have been, those 10-year holding periods have been very positive in the years leading up to this. And what you're seeing is that the, the, the market meltdown in 2008 when the Great Recession hit was so dramatic that it basically wiped out the positive returns of the prior 10 years. And that carried over into 2009. However, the other thing that's worth noting is the very following year, I mean, this is interesting. So the 10-year premium was negative as recently as 2009, and then by 2010, it turns positive, and it's positive for every positive and rising for every year thereafter. So these things can turn on a dime, even though, you know, it's, it, I guarantee you, if, and, and if you were reading the headlines, I'm sure you rem remember this. You know, in 2008 and 2009, you would have prognosticators who would say, well, the, the, the returns of the last, you know, the, the benefits of owning stocks over the last 10 years got wiped out in one year. A whole 10 years worth of returns got wiped out. And that was true. And then you got it all back again within two years. The second year following 2008, in 2000, as quickly as 2010, that 10 year average turned positive again and it did nothing but rise. So, it's very important to realize that even these 10-year phenomenon can turn on a dime. So this is the small company premium. And as you can see, it, it, uh, it, it was actually negative for quite a while. Now, again, I want to emphasize that when I say negative, it, it doesn't mean that the small company stocks. This happens to be a 10-year period from 1989 until 1999. And the thing that's important to note is that this doesn't, this isn't telling us that small company stocks had a negative return during those years. And in fact, small company stocks had a positive return during most of those years. It just means that small company stocks were, were not doing as well as large company stocks. The premium that we expect to earn from small company stocks was not present. And so you can see how that premium could be absent for an entire decade and then suddenly come back gangbusters and actually following the, the, the dot-com meltdown in 2000, small the small company stock premium came back with gangbusters. And in fact, that was one of the strongest of the, of the uh, risk factors in the, in the post-dot-com period were small company stocks, both here and overseas. Now turning to the value premium, uh, you can see that while it's been very dominant for most of the last uh, 90 years, at least for 10-year holding periods, um, for the last eight years, the 10-year holding period was, uh, the premium was negative. And so um, that's one of the longer periods, longer stretches that we've seen that. Now, there are a lot of ways of thinking about this. In some ways, it's a little bit like the dot-com era when the, when the you know, the, the 10 years leading up to the dot-com meltdown, uh, small company stocks lagged because large technology stocks and large growth stocks were, were dominant during the buildup of, of that bubble. Uh, in the current instance, one explanation is, well, and, and one actual factor, is that uh, some of these big technology stocks, the so-called FANG stocks, you know, Facebook and Apple and, and Alphabet and Netflix, you know, they've, these, the, the FANG stocks, these five big stocks have become the five most valuable um, companies in the U.S. market. And they're, and they're high priced, they're growth stocks, you know, they're, they're trading at a high price relative to their, their uh, assets, especially. And so... Whether or not that persists, what we see going forward is an open question. But the one thing that, that we do know is that when investors, when investors uh, give, give companies a low price relative to their earnings or their assets, they are pricing them for high returns. Um, and <clears throat> if you subtract the returns of the those five biggest stocks I'm talking about, 
if you did, if you actually did equal weighting instead of market weighting, if you didn't allow those five stocks to, to represent a you know huge proportion of the returns to the market, you'd see that that value premium would still be positive. So, um, you know, there's it, I think we, we're, there's still reason to believe that the value premium is present, uh, absent what's going on right now with value stocks, and that it still is a, a factor that we want to that we want to uh, incorporate in our portfolio. And again, here we're looking at uh, <clears throat> a grouping of the worst 10-year periods to the best 10-year periods for value stocks. And you can see that these, uh, the, there were far fewer uh, bad 10-year periods for, the, for value premium and many, many more good 10-year periods for the value premium. And in fact, on, and on average, it was much bigger when it was present than when it wasn't. So there's, you know, again, this is because we talk about a sensible economic story. You know, when we talk about um, how we think about these premiums, how we think about these risk factors. And there is a very sensible story to tell about why pushing a stock's price down, and by definition that means pushing it down relative to its earnings or its assets, um, creates a higher expected return. And so this factor is one that, that is, is very fundamental to the way markets work and the way investors interact. And so we expect it to persist. Now again, this is looking just at the this is looking at just the last ten years, the ten years ending at the end of 2018, and you can see that worldwide in the U.S. and outside the U.S., the the small company factor was present. It was smaller in the U.S. than outside the U.S., but it was the the risk premium was the small company premium was positive in all markets. Um, in the U.S., it was negative, um, but again, we we have every reason to believe that that's not going to persist. Now. We're going to end by talking just for a moment in probabilistic terms, in terms of how we think about how to invest, where to put our money. Um, and you can see by this first chart that in any given year, in any given year, there's a 70% chance that the, that the premium will be positive for stocks. So there's a 70% chance that in any given year, you'll make more money being in stocks versus T-bills. Um, and over any, any, over any given five-year period, that rises to 78%. And for any given 10-year period, it rises to 85%. Uh, and you see similar numbers for the value premium and for the small company premium. And so when we think about these, we have to think, we have to think well, if I, was, if I was going to be playing the odds, what would I do? Well. If I have an 85% chance of making money over a 10-year period by being in stocks versus T-bills, those are pretty good odds. I'm going to go with that. And likewise, with small company stocks and value stocks, more often than not, and even, again, over five or 10-year periods, very, you know, very significant majority of the time, I'm going to make more money being in small company stocks and value stocks. So if I'm going to be playing the odds, I'm going to be loading up on those. I'm not going to put, be putting all the money into small or small value stocks. I'm going to be very broadly diversified, but to the degree I overweight anything, to the degree I tilt the portfolio in any direction, it's going to be towards those value stocks and those small company stocks. And again, you can see the same thing applies uh, in overseas markets, in developed overseas markets, the probabilities favor being in stocks, the probabilities favor uh, being in value stocks and, and small company stocks versus growth stocks and large company stocks. And finally, the same things apply in, in, uh, in the emerging markets. So these, are, these are, are persistent, robust factors that transcend marketplaces and geography. We find these, these factors playing out everywhere we look. Emerging markets, developed markets outside the U.S., and then within the U.S. So since these factors persist everywhere where stocks are traded, um, we want to be a global investor. If we're going to be loading up on these risk factors, we want to do so across the largest possible universe of stocks. So that brings us to the end of our tour. And we hope if you have any questions, you feel free to uh, reach out to us. Uh, you can go to our website and find all of our contact information. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from you.